Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another episode of the show. So it's the post-Thanksgiving show. I hit the record button, so this is the first take, the only take we're gonna do. Now this one actually will have three separate segments um, instead of the Thanksgiving. The specials I usually run just straight through instead of like dividing the segments, but this one we're gonna do the actual segments. Uh, we're doing two wines plus an educational segment. And um, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of excited about doing this educational segment. Um, because it's just kind of a kind of a uh, an interesting little thing about labeling laws. So uh, before we get into that, um, let's get into the wines. Now these wines have nothing to do with the educational part. It was just that I had these wines. I bought one of them a long time ago um, for the purpose of review, and it's been sitting in the house for I want to say like seven months. Um, it's been here so long. Uh, when I was briefly looking through all my receipts, I couldn't find the receipt. So I don't remember exactly how much I paid for, but I know how much it goes for. All right, so um, let's get right into this wine. Uh, this is the Tapas Wine Collection Tempranillo 2009. is actually made by a company called Blackboard Wines uh, in the Valencia area um, of Spain. Now this is, oh, we, another Spanish wine. Um, this is in the eastern part of Spain. Uh, and is a Tempranillo, and there's this is again one of those Spanish wines that it's really hard to find a lot of information on. But interestingly enough, I found information on LinkedIn of all places. I found one of the guys involved in um, in this um, venture. So uh, his name is Sergio uh, Paraletagui. I should have practiced that uh, Paraletagui. Perletegui, how about that? Perletegui, so Sergio, all right. And his partner, Dominic Lombard, much easier. Um, they created Blackboard Wines um, and uh, it didn't say when they created it, does it? It says August, well, it says he's the export manager of Blackboard Wines since August of 2011. And uh, prior to that, he was the export manager for Bodegas uh, Carcello um, in Spain. So this looks like it's you know a fairly recent company, but they have a 2009, so they may have got the grapes from 2009. But anyway, so um, that's that's really all there is about this wine. It got it at World Market. Now, um, like I said, I don't remember the exact price, but it was around ten dollars. And we look in the internet, anywhere from eight to ten to twelve dollars. So if I remember, it was like $9.99 or if it might have been $10.99. So, um, but 2009 Tempranillo, uh, this is a grape I've, I've come to really like. Um, I've also come to really like uh, Texas wineries um, making Tempranillos. So um, I'm excited about trying this out. Uh, screw cap enclosure, which is awesome. It means you can't have a cork wine, right? Technically, maybe. Better seal than cork. I don't really care. I mean, it's kind of nice to pull the cork out, right? It's kind of that romantic thing. And, you know, because when you take the screw cap, it makes that horrible sound. But at the same time, you're going to have less of an issue with uh, bad, bad bottles, at least from oxidation. I say all that so I can tempt fate because maybe I'll get a bad bottle of that from a screw cap. But not this time. So, the aromas on the wine, the bouquet, aren't jumping out at me right now. I mean, I guess they have fruit, but, you know, I get a bit of almost tire from it. Almost a little rubber. Almost like rubber ball. 
um, which is not a normal thing that I would get from a wine. I rewatched that Psalm movie a couple weeks ago, and uh, Ian Cobble talked about uh, fresh cut garden hose and and what was the other uh, uh, tennis ball opening up the tennis ball container, which I totally could get that. I mean, I totally remember that as a kid, uh, smelling that uh, fresh cut garden hose. I don't know what, what I don't know what an unfresh cut garden hose smells like versus fresh cut, but they gave him a hard time on that. But having a little bit of that rubber tire aroma to it. It's got some fruit, some nothing specific that I can come up with, just like reddish fruit. A little dark. I mean, if I had to, if I had to pick something, like if I was doing a blind tasting, I had to pick a fruit instead of just saying red fruit, maybe raspberry. And maybe even like a blackberry, maybe more darker fruit. Not really any floral. I don't get tons of earth type of earthiness, but like I said, that that I had with that tire smell too. It doesn't seem to be too much there anymore. Let's check it out. Ooh, kind of hit me, kind of delayed, but a lot of, not a good amount of tannin, but it was like more on the tongue on the tannin rather than, I mean, it's coating the mouth right now, but it was like, it first hit me on the back part of the tongue, like kind of fuzzy, kind of like, like you really got the, ugh. And it's really got, it's got some woodsy to it, woodsiness to it. Um, it. It's the fruit's a little bit more noticeable, but it's not. It's not really fruit, hugely fruit forward. Um, again, really, I think it is more that raspberry and blackberry more than anything else. Maybe a little blueberry to it too, maybe even blue fruit, which I'm not entirely expecting that, but. I also don't seem to get a blue fruit from, from wines a lot, even though that is something that is described in some wines. I, I tend to not get those in the wines it's supposed to come from. And a little bit of spice to it. So, I mean, it's a good wine. It's a good $10 bottle of wine. It's juicy. Um, it's, it's kind of juicy. It's like, you know, biting into the fruit a little bit, um, having a little bit of, of spices in the background, like Christmas spice type, not, not, not pepper. It doesn't seem, doesn't have a lot of pepper to it, but it's nice. It, it's not what I was probably expecting out of a Tempranillo, but it's still good. It's still good, good value. It's around $10. It's at World Market. You're going to find it. Though I looked on World Market's website, couldn't find it, but I know I saw it when I bought the Halloween wine a month ago, and it was right there, prominent, I mean, it had on the display. So it's still available at World Market. They may not just have it on their website, or at least it was a month ago. Um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good, just everyday wine. Uh, something you could, you know, have, you, I, could, I could drink this wine on its own. I know I mentioned in Thanksgiving, there's some wines that, you know, uh, I think that, well, maybe I didn't mention it in the second take of the Pinot Noir. Um, but it, the Pinot Noir was definitely a wine that needed the food um, rather than just a drinking wine. But I could just drink this wine on its own. Kind of just chilling at the house, watching some TV, watching some football. I really haven't mentioned much football because I haven't recorded much. My Vikings. How about my Vikings? Yeah. Two wins. Maybe they've had more since I record this, but they won in England and they won in the United States. Doing pretty horrible this year. Um, I would totally recommend it. I mean, I wouldn't say rush out and get it, but if you see it at, at World Market or wherever you're uh, looking at it and you want a good $10 bottle of wine that's easy drinking and that's got good flavor to it, got maybe some blue fruit to it. The, I get the blue fruit. It's juicy. Totally. Totally get it. Check it out. All right, so we're going to move on to wine number two. 
All right, so wine number two. Now, this wine I'm pretty darn excited about having. All right, so um, those of you that follow me for a little while, or at least the past couple months, I know that I went to New Jersey for a vacation. Now, while it wasn't the point of the vacation to do this, uh, I had hoped to um, get another interview with, with uh, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Also, I was, ho was hoping to get um, an interview with Andre Houston Mack. Uh, unfortunately, neither gentleman was able to meet up with me, which is cool. You know, I know they're busy, especially, you know, Gary's almost, probably every second of his day is planned now. Um, but hopefully I'll make it up there again and uh, we can sit down in his old office. I was hoping to do something like that. But I did stop by Wine Library because, I mean, I was in Jersey. How can I not stop by there? And so I wanted to check it out. And um, so when I was there, I had some great people uh, helping me out and... Um, uh, it was funny because I, I didn't, I, I walked around just kind of to check it out and I didn't really, I didn't really walk in and go, hi, you should know me. Um, but, um, you know, I did, I did mention who I was and then I kind of said, yeah, I had this little wine podcast. I didn't, basically the people who are at wine library who know who I am weren't there. <laughs> These are the people who don't, who have never interacted with me. So, um, but it was kind of funny. It was like, oh, I, Kind of would have thought maybe more people would have recognized the website name, but that's okay. Um, anyway, so I walked around, got a nice little tour. Um, I feel bad because I can't remember the gentleman's name that that actually gave me a tour of of, of upstairs and downstairs. We went into the the climate controlled room, saw a bunch of awesome wines in there. Um, but uh, here we go, and I'm just looking up someone's uh, email address. Because um, while I was there, they were having a tasting. And they had different wines there. And the wine that we're going to do is one of the wines I bought. So I haven't, had, I haven't bought a wine library wine since, what, 2009, I think it was, when the Texas Supreme Court closed the loophole that allows retailers from out of state to sell to residents of Texas and ship to here. Really don't like that rule because I feel it impinges on what I want to do. Um, and it's nothing, it's not against the retailers here in, in Texas. They've got plenty of wine, but if I want a specific wine, I can't get it from a retailer. And the only way I can get it is if I order a case of it and I don't want to buy a case of wine. I just want one bottle. I should be able to buy a bottle from wine library. So, um, it, it's, it, it's, every state has their weird, weird laws. And, and we're going to get to that soon, uh, with labeling. But, um, so I ended up buying the wine and while I was there, there's a, uh, there's a lady named Sandra Zotti and, uh, she was the one conducting the tasting and I feel bad because I still have yet to watch any of her videos, but she was doing video. It was just kind of funny. She says something like somebody was talking to her about video and this, that, and there were some technical glitches and, um, and, uh, so, oh, so you do video. She's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. So didn't recognize me. Fine. <laughs> Deflated a bit. Uh, I was like, well, I do video too. And she's like, oh, really? I said, well, yeah, I happen to have a, you know, pull out my card and, oh, really? Blah, 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 blah. So uh, she sent me an email so I could check out um, her, her stuff. And it's one of those things I have to subscribe to. And I feel bad because Sandra, I have yet to even watch it. So I, 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 I now am required to watch it because I've talked about it on the show. So hopefully before this show came out, I've watched it. And then I've watched the other ones that you've done. But um, so the wine that we got here is... Uh, uh, so let's get right to the wine. So we have the 2007 Brunello di Montalcino. Now that's the that's the kind of wine, but it's from the Capone Ricci. Yeah, Capone Ricci. Uh, put that up. Now I got it uh, for $24.99 a bottle. For $24.99, they were selling it for $29.98 that day. But if you came to the little tasting that day. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned that you got it from that. You got some money off, and it was originally fifty bucks. So we got a fifty dollar Brunello de Montalcino. And if anyone watches the show from back in the beginning of the year, you know that uh, Mr. Kevin Zraeli was with me, and we were talking about Brunello de Montalcino. I don't think I said it quite like he did, but anyway, and that we decided that this, or I decided this was one of my new favorite wines. So. I'm happy about it because I got a Brunello for like 25 bucks instead of getting the Rosso, which is, you know, the baby Brunello. Now, where's Brunello de Montalcino? 
All right, so Brunello Montalcino is a Sangiovese grape. It is from the Tuscany area of Italy. And if you don't know where Tuscany is, it's the western part, northern western part, kind of before the old curve. Um, so Tuscany is very famous for what? Chianti. What grape is a Chianti? Not the Chianti grape, Sangiovese. So Brunello um, is the name that they call Sangiovese in that part of Tuscany. And um, it is uh, not like Chianti, but it's like Chianti, right? Okay, same grape, maybe not exactly in the style of Chianti. So um, anyway, so we got, we got that and um, here we go. So what I have on this, I guess I just had the website just for whatever reason. There really isn't much left to put on that. Um, oh yeah, so Bernardo del Montalcino. There wasn't a whole lot of, of information on the, uh, on the uh, producer. And I think that's really why I was kind of trying to find some stuff on here. So if I can pull up off, off a wine library site to see if there was something from there, because sometimes they give you some cool stuff. It does, it does have a, a pretty good rating for wine enthusiasts. I'm not gonna let that influence me though. I mean, seriously, I'm not. Um, because I, I've had some wines that were supposedly really, really, really high ratings, and I didn't think they were that high. I didn't say they were bad. All right, so let's check it out. Yeah, I don't really know much about uh, Capane Ricci. Um, it was hard to find anything. And I, I found an importer, and I thought they had something on it, but I guess they didn't. I'll just click this link real quick about their fact sheet. Anyway, so let's, let's uh, check it out. Oh, here we go. All right, we'll get to that in a second. Oh, that's right, yeah, and the website didn't work either. So it's got a little funk, a little barnyard. Actually, more like manure is really what it really has. It's not the bad Brett. It's not you know, Brett, Brettanomyces. But yeah, it's got it's got a little funkiness to it, really earthy. I'm gonna let it really swirl around in that in that glass. We're gonna concentrate, do, do what Kevin told me to do. It's really earthy. It's 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 got that wet floor, uh, wet forest floor thing. Um, it's like being in the barn. It's like being in a barn. Um, it's not bad. It's not this this bad funk. It's not band aids and diaper rash. Leave a comment below if you know where that came from. Band aids and diaper rash. Cream, not just diaper rash. If you can tell me what wine that that came from. It's an inside joke with a buddy of mine here. Anyway, um, but it's also got like, dare I say a creaminess to it. Not a, not a dairy thing, just, you know, I don't know. A smoothness to it, a silkiness to it. Not a whole lot of fruit, but I, I kind of got a little plum out of it. If I had a Chianti right next to it, okay, a Chianti Classico, okay, there would be some similarities. I almost want to say, maybe even a little tobacco, which another one of those things like blue fruits, I don't get a lot of times. Good tannins on this, um, but not all over the mouth. Um, but a little bit of fuzziness on, on the uh, on the tongue. Um, so all the funk on the nose isn't really on the palate. Um, it's kind of juicy. It's it's got those fruits to it. Um, it is dry. It's 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 a little earthy to it, almost like dusty. So it's got that. Um, I want to say it's almost like cherry, really, rather than the plum on the palate. 
like like really dark cherries. Okay, I almost feel like I can. I almost feel like I can feel the pits too. Almost minty. Um, definitely got a little bit of spice going on. Really nice wine, smooth. You know, it's, it's a 2000, what, seven? 2007, so it's got a little age to it. Brunellos already come with age when you buy them. They're already aged for a couple years, so um, that's, that's part of how, how they have to be. Um, so let's, about the winery. Uh, so they're, they're located in an area called Sant'Angelo. It's one of the older and more established, or one of the older and more traditional rural establishments in the area of Brunello production. Ferruccio Ricci uh, and his sister Ida uh, manage it. And um, bah, 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 they recently restored it. They use Slovenian oak. And um, they have 12 hectares. And, and that's about as much as you're going to find out about the winery because their website doesn't work. But I really like it. What do they say on here? Ruby red in color, slight garnet hues, and intense, spicy on the nose. Tannic structure, blah, blah, blah. They don't talk about any, they really don't talk about, um, whatchamacallit, uh, the fruit, though. Let's see if they do. Oh, uh, they talk about dark cherry. Oh, I got the dark cherry. Backed by ripe fruit, okay. Cola and hummus. <coughs> um, oh, this is from, oh, this is from uh, Wine Enthusiast. That's why. Balsam. Hmm. Anyway, it got 93 points on Wine Enthusiast. I don't rate wines anymore, as we know, but uh, this is definitely a buy. And you can't buy from Wine Library. They're sold out. Um, but if you can find this producer and this particular vintage for 25 bucks or $30, you need to get it. Good stuff. All right, so let's move on to uh, our educational segment. We're going to be talking about, well, I don't want to say necessarily that's truth in labeling, but we're going to talk about um, how your wine gets labeled and one of the little quirks of the wine labeling laws uh, for the TTV and your state. All right, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Wine 101 is going to be about for sale in your state only. So what is that? Well, this is this little weird kind of law that uh, the, the TTB, uh, which is the government, the federal government organization that, that controls labeling for wines and a bunch of other stuff. So the um, Trade Tobacco and Trade Tobacco Bureau. Trade and Tobacco Bureau. Yes. That's stupid. I cannot remember what the actual TTB. It used to be called, it used to be called the ATF. Anyway, um, anyway, so this particular um, labeling thing um, allows wineries to um, still effectively put the name of the state on their label, even though not all of the grapes have to come from the state. Make sense? I know, it doesn't. All right, so let's talk about what the law says. So wine intended to be sold, distributed, shipped within, within the state it was bottled, Okay, so that's the that's what the law is. Um, the law says 27 CFR Part 4. I don't remember what CFR stands for, but it's one of those, you know, federal, you know, one of those legal things. Uh, labeling and advertising of wine does not apply. So, uh, so that part of the law doesn't apply. And it must comply with the Internal Revenue Code of 1986, 27 CFR Part 4. Okay, so... Let's kind of go a little bit farther with that. So labeling and advertising of wine. So the TTB uh, and, and your state, but the TTB regulates a lot of stuff. Uh, and one of those is labeling of wine. So it regulates what can be on the label. This can include uh, the brand name, the vintage, um, and which you can now, it used to be that you couldn't put American or, or France or Italy so if it was just a generic, it could come from anywhere in that country type of thing. Um, you used to not be able to put a vintage on it. Now you can because the EU allows it. Uh, your appellation of origin, so that's something like 
putting Texas or putting Napa Valley or putting Russian River Valley or Bordeaux or Pomerol or something like that, you know, you, you getting, you know, as specific as, specific as you want. Uh, the grapes, um, it doesn't have to have them, but you include that on there. Uh, it does have to have the alcohol content. It does have to have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it does have the, yeah, it doesn't have to have all the grapes because not all the foreign wines have the grapes on them. Uh, these have a government warning. So the whole thing about don't, don't drink this if you're pregnant and it can cause this, that, and the other. So, uh, and needs to say how much is in the bottle, which in typical normal bottle is 750 milliliters. Okay, or 75 centiliters as they seem to do in Europe. All right, so let's talk about, um, again, more labeling and advertising of wine. So let's talk about appellation of origin and what, the, what you have to do for the law. 75% of the grapes um, have to come from that appellation. So if it's American, uh, the state, or the county, all right? If you're in a multi-state or county situation, um, two, they have to have, uh, you can get from two to three contiguous counties or, or states. Um, you can put the percentage of each, um, you know, percentage of the grapes from each area. Um, and so you can list, you can put multi-state in there. You can say, you can say that, you know, 75% came from Texas and 25% came from New Mexico. However, you can't say 74% came from Texas and 26 came from California. You can't put that on the label, even if that's what happened. And we're going to get to this. This is so that you, you have this this horrible thing about labeling that you can't really put down what's in there. Um, but you could if it was 74% Texas and 26% uh, New Mexico or Oklahoma or Arkansas, Louisiana. All right. If you're using a specific AVA, so let's say you're using Hill Country or Napa Valley or something a little more specific, 85% of the grapes have to come from that area. So I've got uh, a label example up here. I'll have a little better picture going on. Um, so it's got your vintage date, your you know, whether it's a state bottled or not. When there's and uh, a state bottle means that 100% of the wine came from grapes grown on land owned or controlled by the winery. So um, you could have grapes from another part of the state, but as long as they control it, um, in other words, they own the own the vineyard or they have a lot of control over it, uh, then you can put a state bottle. Appalachian of origin, like I said. Um, viticulture area, that's your AVA. Alcohol content. Uh, you also have a, a declaration of sulfites, if it has it in there. I know there are some wines that are made that don't have sulfites, but almost every wine has some kind of sulfites. Uh, your brand name. So uh, in this case, let's say the cartilage and cartilage and brown. Let's put this back here so I don't spill everything, all five of my wine bottles. Uh, varietal designations, um, if you have that. And um, now the varietal designation, let's get back to that. So I talked about grapes and I, it's not that you have to list the grapes, but if you list the grapes, if you list the grape, so Pinot Noir, it has to meet a certain percentage um, of that grape on, in, in the wine to say it's a Pinot Noir. So 75%, and then if you're talking about AVA, it's gonna be 80, or I'm sorry, has, if you're talking about state appellation, it's 85% in Texas and California. Um, so you've got that, and then um, now if you have a blend, you can't say it's Pinot Noir and 74% of it's Pinot Noir and the other 26 is Petite Syrah. You can't do that. Uh, but you can put on the back label the percentages of those grapes. Uh, country of origin, and then you have to have the name address of the winery on the label somewhere, usually the back label. And then uh, you have to have the net content, 750 milliliters. All right, so minimum requirements. Oh, well, you know, we will repeat some of this again. Name and address of the wine premises where bottled or packaged. Uh, brand name, if different from the above. So if the brand name is different than the actual um, the winery that, that bottled it, you have to have that on there. Uh, alcohol content as a percentage by volume or as stated in accordance with 27 CFR Part 4. Um, the kind of wine. 
So the kind of wine. So is this a table wine? Is this a dessert wine? Is it a, um, um, yeah, is it, is it a table wine or dessert wine? Dessert wine in the United States is technically anything that's over 15%. It's not that it's necessarily sweet. It just can has a lot of, has more alcohol in it. Uh, and then, of course, the net contents. All right, so why do we have these issues? Um, so you've got issues where you can have, uh, oh, so, so why, why do we have this issue of the for, for sale in Texas only and, or for sale in New Jersey only or for sale in whatever? Um, so or why is, it, why is there an issue with, with labeling in general? So um, you can have problems with uh, labels because you can have a labeling mistake. You can have a change in tax class, whether it's table versus dessert wine. You could have the alcohol correct, incorrect on there. Uh, has vineyard or estate and brand name. Doesn't meet the minimal varietal requirements. So these are all things that you can have a mistake on the label or have something that's not correct on the label, and you're going to have to correct that. And it's something where um, if you don't get it submitted to the TTB in time, you can be in a lot of trouble. All right, uh, and you can't you can't change the label. Um, unless it's approved. So there's some issues with, like if you print a bunch of labels and you're bottling it, you know, you, you've got issues. If you don't meet these requirements, then you can have some wine you gotta throw out. Not to throw out, but it might cost more. Maybe if it's a cheap wine, uh, it might cost more to relabel than just get rid of it. Now, how common is this whole for sale in your state only? Because that's the other thing. With, with those mistakes, you might have to put for sale in Missouri only because you had some issues like I just talked about. It's possible in any, it's possible in every state. Now, here in Texas, it, it's become a a big debate. Now, I don't know how it is in all the other forty six states because the big four there isn't really that this this issue necessarily, if you want to call it an issue. But in Texas, the past couple of years, especially this last year, uh, a lot of debate with wine bloggers wineries, wine owners, winemakers, um, each, each taking a position on this, and each taking a side. And some of the comments were a little, I wouldn't say not nasty or mean, but, you know, a little heated. Um, and the problem is that there, there's a balance between business and what the law allows you or requires you to do and what, um, and what you want to do just, just to run your business, right? And then you have what you'll have people who are critics of it say it's not truth in labeling. So like I said, you know, you can have an issue with um, you, you put the wrong thing on, on a label and now you can't use Texas on there or you can't call it Napa Valley. So you have to f sell it only in, say, if, say it's a Napa Valley wine, uh, which hopefully would never happen, but say it's a Napa Valley wine and you made a mistake on the label. You now have to, you can put the label how you want it, whatever it says on there. But now you have to put something on that says for sale in California only. Now what happens is you have this issue where people think that, oh, it's some type of special wine. Um, and, and, and in reality, it's, it's not. Not that it's not special, all the wine's special. But there's nothing, it's not like it's special only to that state and that you can't, I mean, you legally cannot buy it outside the state, but there's something about it, you know, that that's, makes it more special than another bottle of the exact same brand even that the label was right. So anyway, it's more common, uh, it's more common in the other 46 states. Now, the biggest reason for this is if you don't have enough, um, if you don't have, uh, you can't meet the varietal minimums uh, for the labeling. So why wouldn't you be able to meet the minimums? I mean, maybe you just have a smaller production, right? Well, what if you don't? What if you want to meet the demand of your of your customers that you want to be able to fulfill all the cases that you have to produce, especially if you're an even larger winery? Well, what happens is you have a poor harvest. I mean, this is an agricultural product. You have you know you have good years and bad years, droughts, rain, hail, hurricane coming through, something you know, tornado could come through your vineyards and and, and devastate them. Um, High demand, like I said, you're trying to meet the demands of your consumers. So trying to be able to get to these get these wines to them um, and still have your brand. 
Uh, you could have a production issue. You could have issues with the fermentation. You could have uh, something go bad with the wine. Um, you could be a brand new winery. Uh, so you're trying to make a name for yourself. So while you don't have your, your, your vineyards haven't matured enough yet, in that, in that first three years, you can't really make a good wine out of, out of, you need at least three years to five years of a vineyard to be able to produce good quality wine because they're not mature enough. So you are buying juice from other areas just so you can get your brand out there. Um, and it could be just, you know, that's what they want to do. They're, they're making a value wine that, you know, they, they, it's, it's their brand. They, they make really good uh, wines that are 100% their own and come from that state or come from that Appalachian or AVA, and they want to do that. Um, so you've, you've, got, you've got, there's some business issues and some, some issues of like they have no choice other than to do this. And the reason why it's more common in the other 46 is because, you know, California makes a ton of wine or they, they grow a ton of grapes. Oregon and Washington and New York State, they all grow plenty of grapes for their own production. Um, California grows plenty of grapes for the production of it and they have it a surplus. So they, they sell it. And the other 46 states, Texas is one of those, we don't have enough production in the state to meet the demand of just the people in the state for our wines. So is this deceptive or not? Some say it is. Uh, it's confusing to the customer. Um, again, it says for sale in New Jersey only. Uh, it makes it confusing as to well, why is it for sale in New Jersey only? You know, is it illegal if I take it across state lines? You know, who's going to know if, it, if you did, but it's, no, it's not illegal if you take it across state lines. As long as you're not trying to sell it, as long as you're just bringing it, um, you know, it, it just means that it doesn't meet the labeling requirements of the federal law. Um, then you also have things like it hides the appellation of Oregon, of origin at Oregon origin. So again, even though you don't have an appellation of origin on the front label, you've got somewhere on the label that it's made by a Texas winery or made by a uh, New Mexico wine or whatever. You know, I, I keep saying Texas a lot because that's the state I live in. But, you know, it's made in your state and you can't put the state appellation or any other appellation on there. But on the back label, it says, you know, it's Mark's Winery in San Antonio, Texas. So, oh, okay, it's a Texas wine. Well, yes and no. Uh, law doesn't allow non-contiguous state appellations. So let's say, let's say you do have, you can't, you can't call it, a Texas wine, because you don't have 70, we well, can't call it, it doesn't have 85% of the grapes in it, but let's say even 75%, so you can't call it, you know, a certain appellation. So, but you get the rest of your grapes from another part of the country that's not a state neighboring to you. Or, yeah, so you have to put this for sale in New Mexico only, and say it was New Mexico wine. You couldn't get the grapes from Arizona, Colorado, or Texas, or Oklahoma. What was all the ones? Nevada? Yeah. So, or Utah, whatever. So, but you, it's not a neighboring state, so you got to get it from somewhere else. Uh, and sometimes it's just a necessary evil. Again, it's just part of doing business. For some of these wineries, when, when their production is something wrong with the production, they, their harvest is horrible, and they've got to meet demand again, then they've got to create these wines. So, does it matter in, in the long run? Okay, so for the average person, um, they'll see it and yet yeah, it's confusing to them and, and they're like, well, it's, it's, you know, it's wine from my state, so I sh it should be good. But the average consumer is probably not going to really care. It, it's, it's the brand. It's like buying Coke. All right. It doesn't matter where the Coke was made. It's Coke. Okay. And when you think about wine and how it's made, a winemaker in a particular state can get grapes from an, some of the grapes from another part of the state or another part of the country. And through his production methods or her production methods can make the wine in a style that he or she wants. And that's the style that the consumer is expecting. Because of how you produce it, especially with the yeast, all the kind of yeast you can use, you can manipulate your wine to be taste like last year's wine. Maybe you got 100% of your grapes from your state. It's probably going to taste pretty darn close to the average person to exactly what they had last year. So to them, it's, again, like a brand, like a Coke, it tastes the same no matter where you buy it in the United States. Uh, they, they, try, they, they work very hard to make sure the formula stays the same, just like going to McDonald's, the Big Mac 
in San Antonio is going to taste like the Big Mac in Seattle. Um, so your average consumer, consumer is probably not going to matter. It's for us, the wine geeks that are all geeked out about it has to come from this area so I get the, the true uh, flavor of the terroir, okay? Which I fall into that plenty of times. If I'm looking at Texas wineries and I'm at the store and it says for sale in Texas only and I'm doing a wine review of it, I will very likely not buy the wine. And I'm not trying to slam the Texas wineries to do that. It's just that I'm trying to evaluate a wine that is from Texas that uses the majority of Texas grapes so that we're evaluating what is a Texas wine is supposed to taste like. Not, oh, this is brand XYZ winery from such and such part of Texas and this is the kind of wine they make. Is it good wine? My show doesn't necessarily do that. However, if I do get a wine that says for sale and blah, blah, blah only, that's the approach that I have to take. So solution, well, you can allow clear labeling. You could allow the winemakers to label exactly what's going on. You know, they can say, and you, you can say, uh, I got 50% of the grapes from Texas and I got 40% of the grapes from California. I got 10% of the grapes from Oregon. And they're all Pinot Noir, probably not from Texas, but they're all Cabernet Sauvignon or something like that. Um, allow for non-appellation issues. So allow, allow for those issues with, with whether it's contiguous or not. Um, so you're able, to, you're able to, again, label exactly what it is. You can even require it. So instead of like giving the loophole of saying, well, if you can't meet the labeling requirements because the label's bad or because production's bad or that's just how you want to operate, you can still quote truth in labeling and say, well, if you, you can't necessarily say it's a, a, a New Jersey wine because it doesn't meet the minimum requirements. However, you still you need to, you need to put down that 70% 70, 70 of the grapes came from New Jersey and the other 30 came from Virginia, okay? New Jersey does, I mean, has it, because I saw it at the, at the wine festival I did up when I was up there, um, which is kind of weird because you would think that they get the, the rest of the grapes from New York, uh, but they, they are getting grapes from California or other parts of the country. Uh, educate the public. Just be more aware. Maybe it's the wineries are educating them. Maybe it's uh, the TTB or whatever, but there's more of an awareness campaign that, you know, again, not trying to slam the winery for doing it, but you just want them to be aware if you're, if you're looking for a wine that came from that state or evokes that, that part of the country, um, it's not going to necessarily because not en enough of the grapes came from that part to, to do that. Um, or the TTB just eliminates the need for the phrase. So that's uh, going to do it with the, uh, with the labeling thing. Uh, my opinion on it is I don't like it. I don't like the labeling. Um, I, I think there are some wineries around the country that hide behind it because their consumers really do think that the wine came from that state. Um, I know that there are wineries out there that, that say that they are hoping, of, hoping to eliminate it, um, but some of these wineries have been around for a long time. So you would think they could eliminate it, but then again, their, their demand maybe is outstripping production. Again, you know, just because you're the biggest winery in the state or one of the biggest wineries in the state doesn't mean you can get all the grapes. Somebody else has contracted those grapes for a different winery. So it's, it's a touchy situation. Uh, I'm trying to be as, as uh, political as I can by not necessarily uh, coming down one side or the other, but my, my opinion really is that, that, that the labeling needs to be clearer um, we need to have the flexibility to say exactly what it is. Uh, I, think the, I, think the, I think the phrase is a bad phrase. Um, I think there's a better way of putting it instead of for sale in Texas only or whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, I can understand why wineries do it because now I've talked to some wineries about it. I understand their position, and I, and I could think of myself as being in a similar position, especially if I was a new winery and I was trying to establish myself, I need to get some revenue in because three to five years of no revenue sucks. Uh, you know, there's millions of dollars going to these things. So next time you're at the wine shop and you see a wine and it says for sale in your state only, uh, just realize that um, if you're looking for a wine that, that speaks of that state's terroir, um, it, may not have, it may not really do that. It might be just 74% of the grapes came from that state and the other 26 came from somewhere else. So that's, you know, pretty decent amount, right? I mean, that 1%, is that really going to matter? 
that it's not, oh, it doesn't, doesn't evoke the Texas terroir because it's 74% versus 75. You know, who, who determined that one? Um, you know, I mean, maybe if it was 30% from Texas, okay, I could get it. It doesn't evoke the, the Texas terroir, but just know what that is. Um, and it's your decision whether to buy it or not. You know, if it's a good wine, who cares? Okay, if you like the wine and it has that label on it, then buy the stupid thing because you're gonna like it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the wine. That's the other thing I wanted to say about this because I, I, I criticize the labeling a lot, but I wanna say there's nothing wrong with the wine um, unless there's a flaw, an actual flaw in production, but nothing wrong with the wine. It is a beverage, uh, a beverage that's tasty and we like and it has alcohol in it and that, all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, if that's what you want, then you should be able to buy it. I just wish that with the labeling laws a little bit clear. Uh, that's going to do it for this educational segment. Uh, I know earlier in it was a little confusing because I kind of lost track of what I was getting at. Hopefully I brought it back into that. But um, uh, next week uh, we're going to have some uh, Syrah Petit Syrah. We're going to talk about the differences between the two grapes. So again, I want to thank everyone for stopping by. Hit the links above to friend me up. Hit the link uh, over here, the donate button to send me some money. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.